welcome everybody to the 28th Eccles Institute Bryant Lecture. It is fabulous to see so many of you here in person at the British Library and also welcome to everybody who's joining us remotely from around the world. Um, we are so excited to have this lecture by Jesse Armstrong. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the head of the Eccles Institute at the British Library. And if it's okay with you, I just want to take a few minutes um, before I introduce the British Library Chief Librarian, Liz Jolly, who's going to introduce Jesse, just to say a few things about the Eccles Institute because it is such a wonderful um, organisation. It was set up in 1991 with a very generous endowment from Mary and David Eccles in order to encourage learning, understanding, scholarship and conversation about the Americas. Um, we are always trying to showcase the British Library's incredible world-class um, collections and I want to thank here there are fellows we have supporters institutional supporters like the ATBL um, the Fulbright Commission the US Embassy so many people and of course the Eccles family who've been supporting our work for over 30 years the Eccles Institute is involved with a whole range of activities. Um, we sponsor um, scholarship and learning for any type of learner. So whether you're creative, whether you're an academic, if you're um, a citizen researcher, uh, we're really interested in finding out what you want to do and in supporting your work from all across the world as well. We award two prizes every year of 20,000 pounds each uh, for works of fiction and non-fiction. We collaborate on research uh, grants, we help teachers and students, and we organize events like this. And in short, uh, if you're interested in the Americas, we're really interested to hear from you. Now, in terms of this evening, uh, the Bryant, uh, the Eccles Institute has been hosting an annual lecture since uh, 1992, 1993, and in 1995, it was named after Douglas W. Bryant. He was born in 1913 in California. He served in the Second World War as a naval officer, and then he came back to his California where he became the librarian at Berkeley University. He then got recruited by the US Foreign Service and moved to Britain and was in charge of US libraries in Britain. Then he returned back to America, worked at Harvard in the libraries there and became the director of libraries at Harvard. But he always maintained incredibly close links with British libraries and librarians and in honor of his contribution to the British Library he set up the American Trust for the British Library a brilliant fundraising organization still going strong today um, in order to honor his contribution to the British Library the Eccles Institute um, named this lecture after him the Eccles um, Institute Bryant lecture really is the um, keynote event of our uh, calendar year. A unique opportunity to think about the USA and its relation to the world with key thinkers and experts in their field. Previous lecturers have been Lonnie Bunch, Kimberly Crenshaw, Lise Doucette, um, that's one I Gordon Carrera, and sorry, and also John Sopel, who I'm delighted to say is here tonight as well. And we are absolutely thrilled to be adding Jesse Armstrong to that list. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Liz Jolly, who is the British Library's chief librarian. She is going to introduce Jesse, and then at the end of uh, Jesse's lecture, she'll be taking, they'll be taking questions from the audience. So Liz, over to you. Hello everyone. It's very exciting to be introducing Jesse Armstrong as a speaker for the 28th Bryant Lecture in American Studies. I'm imagining everyone in the room is a fan of one and probably all of the shows he's been instrumental in creating. To recap on the programmes we can thank him for. He was a co-creator and co-writer with Sam Bain of Peep Show and Fresh Meat. He worked on The Thick of It, Veep and Charlie Brooker's Black Mirror, as well as the films Four, Lion, Four Lions and In the Loop, for which he was nominated for an Oscar in 2009. He's also, as I'm sure you all know, the creator and showrunner of HBO's Succession, 
the series which gave us the dysfunctional media dynasty, the Roys, and some of the best one-liners in television history. A graduate of American Studies and American History at the University of Manchester, Jessie has a long-standing interest in the USA and its relation to the world. As a portrait of contemporary America, succession was acutely observed and both deeply affectionate and very frightening. And it raises important questions about the role of the media and mis- and disinformation in the collapse of democracy. These questions are especially relevant in the context of the British Library, where preserving knowledge, providing free access to information and promoting information, digital and media literacy are at the core of our mission. We also have a long-standing interest in the USA, whether through our landmark America's collections or through more than 30 years of the Eccles Centre's focus on engagement and research in the region. Now, with the newly established Eccles Institute and as stated in our most recent strategy, we have reasserted our commitment engaging with and about the USA. This evening's lecture comes at a perfect time for the library for us and for us all. And so I'm so delighted to welcome Jesse to the stage. Jesse. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, a packed audience. Um, when I picked my mum up from the station today, uh, I told her that it had sold out, and she said, and it's just you. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was... <laughs> <laughs> uh, just me, but um, <laughs> but thank you very much. I'm honoured to be here, um, in part because of the illustrious previous givers of this lecture, lecture, and also because the first director of the Eccles Institute was Professor Robert Birchill, who was head of American Studies at Manchester when I studied there in the 1990s. Professor Birchill brought a whiff of Oxbridge to Hacienda-era Red Brick Manchester. <laughs> 30 years on, the people I'm still in touch, st in touch with from university still pepper emails with fragments of his speech. Lapsang Souchong, far too expensive for students. <laughs> <laughs> he would tell us as he made us all tea in the tutorials, which even when I wasn't slightly stoned, I only did that once, uh, <laughs> were bracingly hard to keep up with. He was acerbic and rather intimidating, but never patronising. He did us the rather terrifying compliment of taking us at 19 seriously. And his prickly demeanour made his occasional fragments of praise all the more valued. Without his encouragement, I might not have taken my degree so seriously or stayed on to do the MA in American history I couldn't have afforded without the British Academy grant he helped me obtain. He also connived with the rest of the department in turning a blind eye to my attending off the book, off the books, the novel writing MA run by Richard Francis and Michael Schmidt. It was in their class I met Sam Bain, my longtime writing, part, writing partner. Richard's here tonight. Hello, Richard. <laughs> uh, so I was flattered when Polly invited me to give this talk. After all, a lecture. Who doesn't love to be lectured? <laughs> he lectured me for 45 minutes straight. People observe fondly. <laughs> <laughs> so while I was certain I wanted to get a group of people together and bang on at length, I could not initially identify a suitable subject. What I've settled on is this. I've been involved with the writing of several TV shows and films set, or partly set, in America. An episode of Veep, uh, the film In the Loop, The Day Shall Come with Chris Morris, and what I'm best known for right now, HBO's Succession. So I'd like to use this as an opportunity to reflect on the end of the show and to think about the many potential problems and few potential benefits one has writing a show from, about the US from outside, in my case as both a non-citizen and a non-long-term non resident. It's happening more and more, even just amongst writers I'm familiar with. In recent years, there's been Alice Birch's Dead Ringers, Georgia Pritchett's The Shrink Next Door, Charlie Brooker with certain shards of his Black Mirror, Sasha Baron Cohen with Borat, Bruno, and Who is America, Sharon Horgan with Divorce, Andrew Hayes Looking, Armando Inucci and Simon Blackwell and Tony Roach with Veep, Hussein Amini with Drive, Alex Garland's film Civil War is out right now doing great business, I think. This clutch of examples joins the long list of non-natural-born American writers who've written about the country, from Chaplin and Billy Wilder for the screen, to Vladimir Nabokov, Auden and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie on the page. 
So this lecture is going to offer some thoughts on the question of, the questions of, whether it is legitimate to write about America from the outside. If it is, can you hope to write good work, especially a TV show set in America, without being an American? And if you're going to try it, what are the weaknesses you need to beware? And then, and this is what I want to be most careful about, but are there any advantages at all to being an outsider? So, we can begin. No interval, no drinks. <laughs> this is just it. No Brian Cox, no Sarah Snook. <laughs> I think Rob Webb is here. Maybe look at him if I'm getting boring. <laughs> but basically, this is going to be it, me talking. So, is writing something set in the US, US as an outsider right now, in this combustible moment, amongst institutions under threat, a political system so frayed, a culture so fractious and flammable, is it wise? Is it possible? Is it okay? After all, it's hard to imagine foreign writers marching into Lagos's Nollywood or Bombay's Bollywood as blithely as British writers do into the pitching rooms of LA, New York, and their UK satellite offices expecting a small bottle of water and some airtime. <laughs> we, are we, British writers, culturally appropriating America when we write it? Well, I suppose all questions of cultural appropriation are really questions of power. And obviously there are communities within the US which, if you were trying to write into, the questions of power is pertinent. But the idea that you could be meaningfully disrespectful in your take overall on America is like claims of reverse racism. To believe it, you must ignore the very physics of the universe you're looking at. Racism doesn't have any meaning without power, without a power dynamic behind it, without history being factored in, and nor do complaints about outsiders taking a questioning look at the US. Taken as a whole, not individual communities and cultures, but as a political entity, the US is the preeminent world power. And whatever the fears we have about where it might be heading, America has the dollar, the Fed, Silicon Valley, the warheads, and Hollywood. So, America, you can take it. <laughs> From your critics, your inquisitors, those who live there and those who don't. Indeed, in a certain quite real sense, we actually do live in America. Much of the world does. But, but us in the UK more than anyone. Amazon, Apple, Meta Facebook, Microsoft, Netflix, Alphabet, Google, Disney, they all shape our world in ways we're pretty aware of. Starbucks and KFC, Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's are all around us too. But Angus Hanton in his recent Vassal State points out Weetabix, Boots, Costa Coffee, HP Source, Sky, they're all US brands now too. The largest US companies sell $700 billion worth of goods and services each year over here, over a quarter of our total GDP. We have 13 US military bases operating on our soil. US corporations have more employees in the UK than in France, Germany, Italy, Portugal and Sweden combined. Our economic and imaginative spheres and our Atlanticist political culture mean we live in the UK in something of a rainy Puerto Rico. Without representation, <laughs> without representation in the Senate or the House, but deeply affected by the flows of American capital and the moods of American culture. Indeed, I think we can say that it's more than okay for outsiders to write about the US. It's necessary. Amblavana Sivanandan this famous af aphorism about immigration as an imperial legacy is apposite here. We are here because you were there. And similarly, people who don't live in America have some standing to write about America because America is everywhere. The global champ. And everyone knows you're allowed to take a pop at the champ. I'm going to get a glass of water. <laughs> during this portion. <coughs> yeah, everyone knows you're allowed to take a pop at the champ. However, the fact that the US is big enough <coughs> to take criticism doesn't mean your take on it can't be dumb, annoying, trite, patronising, or just wrong. In particular, the British point of view on America has a history of condescension, fading but still detectable. You know how it goes. Americans are fat, Americans are stupid, American beer is weak, America is uncultured, prone to violence, and most of all, wealth-obsessed. It's there in the American sections of Dickens's Martin Chuzzlewit. All their, all their cares, hopes, joys, affections, virtues, and associations seem to be melted down into dollars. Do anything for dollars. What a flag it is to them. 
Dickens's normal fine moral discrimination seems to go, seem to go AWOL. The people lumped together as spittoon, hawking, overeating, wrong talking, socially boastful incarnations of the selfish ways of life Martin must put aside to thrive. There's no doubt there's much to say about America's faults, and it can be fun saying it. But if you want to about, write about America now, 180 years on, you need to make sure you're writing about a real America, not the British dream nightmare version of it, which is like those, Ameri those generic American accents British actors used to deploy, which come from nowhere and stand from nothing. After all, just because America can take it, that doesn't make your line of attack automatically valid. And we Britishers don't have any special birthright interesting perspective. I occasionally get asked in British media interviews if there's something particular about the British sense of humour. It always feels like an invitation to self-satisfaction. BMW may own Rolls-Royce cars, but we still know how to make the best comedy. A moth-eaten note of irony is the last bit of currency in the imperial vault. <laughs> if so, we really are bankrupt, because while I love Jane Austen and Evelyn Warren, looked up to and learned from Armando and Chris Morris and the British comic satirical tradition, it was Woody Allen and Joseph Heller, Elaine May, Billy Wilder, who I first loved. Seinfeld and Larry Sanders and Annie Hall were the models Sam Bain and I looked to when we tried to learn how to write sitcom. It's only the cloth-eared who think we're singing at a more delicious pitch. Only those, ironically, who lack an ear for subtlety who think Americans don't catch irony. It's true, possibly, that in US social business settings, the default British, and perhaps not particularly funny, sarcasm is left in less in evidence, perhaps in a culture made up of so many cultures in a land of such breadth, you need to be a little more direct in your everyday public communication to signal, I am your friend, all is well, have a nice day. But that doesn't mean that the American ear isn't attuned to other frequencies, it is. So I would say if you're going hunting for easy targets on the wide American plane, you might find it a bit overhunted. Mark Twain, H.L. Mencken, James Thurber, Dorothy Parker, Laurie Moore, as well as Mac Raining, Larry David, Jordan Peele, and Tina Fey might suggest you cool your jets. <laughs> so if the U US is perfectly capable of self-medicating in terms of criticism, and since precision and knowledge of your subject are essential prerequisites for a good piece of writing, and these are so much easier to achieve for someone born in the US, is it possible for an outsider to get their chisel in there? Well, yes, I'd say, fortunately, the US is very amenable to outsiders. It is, after all, a nation built by outsiders. It wasn't until Martin Van Buren, the eighth president, whose first language was Dutch, that they had a head of state who was even born a US citizen. A bit of American studies. <laughs> <laughs> the US is self-consciously an experiment, the city on the hill, an experiment asked to be observed, tested, and reported upon. And it's a society that is possible to get to know. This is a nation whose history can be surveyed. There will always be more to learn, but you can just about get your head around America. You can just about remember all the presidents, who even was the first king of England or France. The last time I was in DC, I went to see the Constitution, stood in line with citizens who respectfully peered through the glass at the big Gothic promise of that opening, we the people. We famously have no Constitution. It's suspended somewhere between Magna Carta and whatever the Speaker of the House of Commons and the BBC's chief political correspondent says can happen. <laughs> but alongside being codified and legible, the other reason you can find a way into the US is because America is constantly being remade. I wouldn't agree with Wyndham Lewis, picked up by Martin Amis, that it is a moronic inferno, but it is some kind of furnace. In the vast melting pot, you can find a bubble to ride. It's permeable to outsiders, and it is generous to them. I've constantly relied on the kindness of strangers in the US and rarely been disappointed. The country always fascinated me. At 17, unable to afford the plane fare all the way to the West Coast to visit an American friend, I flew to New York and took the Greyhound bus across the middle, pretty much on the verge of scurvy, scooping peanut butter from the pot with my fingers for five days. But when I think of American generosity, I think of the people on the bus the ones who, when a Hungarian traveller in pyjamas had his stuff stolen out of the hold in Reno in the middle of the night, and though they had very little themselves, held a whip round and kitted him out with clothes and shoes and enough money to get to the coast. It was an instance of openness and generosity which linked together sentimentally in my mind with the way my fellow writers and I were carried through the production of succession, especially through COVID, by American ingenuity and can-do spirit. 
So if it's artistically and morally acceptable and practically achievable, what can you bring to the table as an outsider writing America? What if we were on The Apprentice, created by Mark Burnett, born London 1960? <laughs> Thanks, Mark, for the show and all it has given the world. <laughs> <laughs> What would we say is our unique selling point as non-citizens? Well, perhaps Veep could have been written by Americans and the West Wing by an outsider, but the fact is they weren't. And I don't think it's just a trick of the light which, make, which makes it a little hard to imagine the nationalities of the authors being swapped. Could Succession have been written by an American? I think it could, but I don't know. As again, as it happens, it wasn't. So what does an outsider perhaps see that a citizen doesn't? at least not in the same way. It's worth saying here that outsider is a slippery term, and I'm aware there is a certain off-putting, self-regarding twinkle in the eye of someone who declares himself to be one. <laughs> the Bukowski-ish cool guy watching the wheels go round from the sidelines with a scotch and a superior smile <laughs> while writing some version of look at all these phonies in his notebook. <laughs> <laughs> We know that guy. Uh, <laughs> some of us are that guy. <laughs> also, it's worth saying some outsider positions are more comfortable than others. A European white man adrift in America, I would recommend all the delicious alienation, less of the physical danger. Indeed, it's probable that, it's probable that I come, it's probable that though I come from a different nation state, I might be more comfortable race, class, gender, sexuality-wise in the corridors of US media power than some natural-born Americans. After all, America has a history of making its own outsiders. Those pushed out or not folded into the flag so fast, new immigrants, the native inhabitants, and especially people taken there against the will, slaves and their free descendants robbed of the economic, social, and political capital they might have been building up. So I realize there are lots of ways of being an outsider in America, and many of them don't require you to come from elsewhere. But thinking for a moment, about those who have a different perspective because they were born in another nation, you have a wide range of variety of outsider types. There are the visitors who come and imbibe the atmosphere and write up their impressions, like Dickens in Chuzzlewit, Evelyn War with the loved one. Then there are the sojourners who spend a while living and working but don't relocate for good, Sadie Smith with On Beauty, Martin Amos's Money. Most of the British showrunners are some version of this, tending to live in America to make shows but remaining long-term resident in the UK. Then there are the emigrants, writers who were born abroad but moved to the US young. They often still carry their outsider perspectives. I. A. L. Diamond, who co-wrote The Apartment and Some Like It Hot, Yellowface author R. F. Kang, and Gary Steingart, whose super sad true love story is such a funny, bleak version of the American future. And then there are the exiles, those who came out who, ca who came not out of choice, Vladimir Nabokov and the great wave of Weimar emigres, Billy Wilder, Douglas Sirk, Fritz Lang, Otto Preminger. There are even the imagined Americas of those who never visited, like Franz Kafka, or spin us an America as imagined by those far away, Flann O'Brien's unified stations of Ameriki in The Third Policeman, with its dollars and bucks and nuggets in the ground and any amount of rackets, a great conundrum of a country. <coughs> I'm told they're very fond of shooting matches in that quarter. <laughs> they are quite fond of shooting matches in that quarter. <laughs> and finally, there are all the other complicated ways life works. Alexander McKendrick, born in the US but grew up in Scotland, and whose sweet smell of success can still leave you gut-punched at its full reckoning of a zero-sum game. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who, like the world she explores in a fiction, lives between the US and Nigeria. Raymond Chandler, born in US but schooled in the UK. For most of these varieties of non-native-born Americans, there is an element of coming afresh to their American subject. Half good guest, half gimlet-eyed, ice chip in the heart, literary spy. After all, all writers are always spying a little. Even someone as thoroughly American as John Updike said he thought of himself as, quote, a literary spy within average public school supermarket America. Indeed, once you start thinking about the writer, a spy in America, they start popping up everywhere, creeping around in pale fire. Now I shall spy on beauty as none has spied on it yet. At the start of the bell jar, that crackling dark opening, 
It was a queer, sultry summer, the summer they electrocuted the Rosenbergs. Or in so many successful TV, US TV shows, the spies hiding within in Homeland, the Americans, in 24. Maybe that's one reason for the artistic flourishing of the US. It's so easy to be outside of, even for the homegrown, full of a chorus of, I like to be in Americas, by people who are playing a part, trying to be American, even when they already are. Full of spies in the supermarket, invisible men like Ralph Ellison's, and actual anthropologists like Zora Neale Hurston. Or Jerry, Elaine, and George, forever thinking they found the hidden, the hidden rule, cracked the code of life, and it is to do the opposite. <laughs> or investigating the secret canon of social case law, can you double dip a chip? Like Raymond Chandler's heroes trying to untie the complicated knots of LA. Or Billy Wilder hunting out with us, the audience, in Stalag 17, the German spy in the POW bunkhouse, the one who is, like Wilder himself, at home amongst, but also at odds with, his American compatriots. And all this spying, this icy looking, what is it good for? Where does it lead? Well, what does the guest see that the resident of a home doesn't? You notice the smell, which the resident is habituated to. You see the striking, the alarming cracks in the wall the resident has stopped noticing. But sometimes you also see a big picture, the striking grandeur of a room where the resident can now only see the cracks. The guest can get things wrong, make silly mistakes and slip-ups, misread the codes. But that lack of habituation, if handled right and handled with humility, can, can be a strength. Because the hardest thing to get, I'd say, in any work of art, certainly a TV show, the single most essential and also ineffable thing you're looking for is a tone. A good tone in a show helps so much else. From the big stuff, the show's perspective on the arena you're investigating, to the practical stuff, the sorts of people you'll cast. Even on a technical craft level, where you should come in on a story and where you should end. Comedy or tragedy are, after all, in some ways, just a question of where you choose to leave your characters, at the altar or at the deathbed. Tone is the key to a successful show. It's also, unhelpfully, pretty much impossible to describe. <laughs> you both need it in your head when you start, but can't begin to describe it until the whole thing is done. If it's off, nothing lands. If it's working, you can navigate the piece to surprising places. And I think maybe, 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 that's three maybes, <laughs> what being an outsider gives you, while certainly not the whole tone is a start, if not the whole voice an accent. And what is that tone? Is there a commonality between the many different tones foreign-born writers take on in America? One thought, a tentative one, is there perhaps a silent, unwritten introduction to foreigners writing about the US which tees things up, sets the stage on all that follows by saying silently something like, holy fucking shit, <laughs> come and take a look at this, you will never believe it. <laughs> And then, with disgust, delight, amazement, horror, or cheap, hypocritical dismay, whatever, it doesn't have to be a good tone, but that initial tuning up, that heightening of sensitivity, that sense that there is something inherently interesting here, that's good for writing. So if there are a variety of ways to be an outsider, and being one might, might, give you an angle of approach, one question that occurs is whether different varieties of non-native writers on America have different tones. Does the willing adult emigre, for example, maybe have a softer focus? Perhaps it might be natural that these people who knew what they were getting into are more, comfortable, com more comfortably accommodated in the US, least skeptical. I think of Ernst Lubitsch, Hitchcock, Chaplin, though he was pushed out later, and the generation of British directors who came out of advertising to make such successful careers in the US. Alan Parker, Tony Scott, Ridley Scott, Hugh Hudson. The exile perhaps has a tougher take, driven into paradise, as composer Arnold Schoenberg described himself and the German and Austrian emigres who made 40s and 50s Hollywood Weimar on the Pacific. Perhaps there is a variety of exile art which is attracted to themes like shifting identities, which leans towards black humor, subversion. Billy Wilder was, after all, triple or quadruple Auslandish, 
outsider-ish, chased from Galicia, Vienna, Berlin, and Paris by anti-Semitism. He knew change, that the worst change was possible, and lived long enough that the child he saw at the side of the last Habsburg emperor in Vienna, four-year-old Crown Prince Otto, eventually came in to pitch a movie to him at his office on the Paramount lot. <laughs> that kind of rather dizzying historical irony, how could it not end up colouring your sense of the world? And if those Weimar exiles had a specific tone, thinking closer to home, do British, obs British observers offer a particular perspective on the country with which we are so interlinked? Let's find out. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, 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 that's four maybes. It seems possible we're comfortable with a certain profitable acceptance of hopelessness. A declining power, maybe it gets in our bones, living in a Piranesi full of T.S. Eliot's falling towers. Just as China is full of techno-utopianism, finding solutions to the three-body problem and much else, maybe in our cradles we've drunk some sour milk which accept that all projects, grand and small, end up as vast and trunkless legs of stone standing in the desert. Is something a British writer is more comfortable with, familiar with, a conscien conscious acceptance of guilt in the necessary hypocrisy of power, with the whole thing being a lie? The imperial project, a smokescreen for creeping pink cartographical domination, while white America, at least, always has the city on the hill, the last best beacon of hope, and finds it, finds it hard to imagine the true potential emptiness of heart of an imperial project. Okay, we've done most of the highfalutin stuff. We're rolling home. I want to mention a few of the fun things about writing in America, of a, few of the, a few of the things to beware, and then we're going to be done. So, good stuff about writing America. Reasons, perhaps, why you could give it a whirl. Bullet points. American speech is great. Shorter, punchier. My favourite dining experience begins not with an outline of the metaphysical concerns behind the chef's culinary philosophy, but one of those New York diner waiters who comes over, pad open, and says, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> new words, new coinages, a madness for contraction and mixing. Ezra Pound said, make it new, and they do. Always bubbling. Anything that can be said will be said. It's intoxicating. It's freeing. I sit in one of the dives on 52nd Street, uncertain and afraid, Auden wrote in September 1939. Almost like any giddy Brit just arrived from JFK, excited to be getting to grips with the subtle meaning of each gradation of those New York cross streets. Raymond Chandler, in whose prose you can sense someone, you can perhaps sense someone with ears freshly alive to American idiom from his youth at Nigel Farage's Dulwich College. This is Philip Marlowe going to meet a client in Farewell, My Lovely. It was a nice walk, if you like grunting. <laughs> there, <laughs> there were 280 steps up to Cabrillo Street. They were drifted over with windblown sand and the handrail was as cold and wet as a toad's belly. You can also maybe feel Martin Amis's excitement to be out of the UK in the famous opening of money. As my cab pulled off FDR Drive somewhere in the early hundreds, a low-slung tomahawk full of black guys came sharking out of lane again with the cross streets. There is, however, perhaps a line to be wary of crossing for Brits overly excited to be liberated into US speech. I remember hearing about the streets of provincial post-war England when kids got their hands on comics but hadn't heard much real American speech and would go around exclaiming, gee whiz. <laughs> you have to be careful of gee whizzing in your excitement to be writing American. But it's fun to dive in, to get to be direct, and say right out, you're uncertain and afraid. So much of British language, especially humour, is about the not saying, of, about the not saying of things. Don't mention the war, or euphemism, up to a point, Lord Cowper, or Humphrey Appleby's advice to a colleague to sow seeds of doubt about a minister's disagreeable plans by praising them as courageous. <laughs> which is even worse than calling them controversial. After all, he explained, controversial only means this will lose you votes. Courageous means this will lose you the election. <laughs> I love all that. But it's exciting to have access to US brevity, astringency, telling it straight, telling it brutal. 
Dorothy Parker chased for a piece told her editor, too fucking busy, and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> Americans are always on the guard for fanc fancification. In The Simpsons, Moe even claims to find Homer's use of the word garage Frenchified. <laughs> Some of you know what's coming. And affected, he claims to prefer the plain old American term, car hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible that in succession we winkled out a profitable clash between two traditions, the saying and the not saying. Taking your time and enjoying language games is somewhat against the rules of TV and movie storytelling, where the premium is on speed, no goodbyes on the phone, no change from the bartender. But being a bit more expansive linguistically allowed us to make a show, as well as many other things, to make the show, as well as many other things, something of a horror show about language losing its meaning. All those low IQ genius ideas in corporate and media spheres, all the exciting new challenges which are likely to leave you without a job. And of course, one of the great freedoms about American language for a British writer is being released a little from class games. Jerry Seinfeld observed that the luge, the one-person bobsleigh, was the only Olympic sport you could conceivably compete in against your own will. <laughs> For the British, class is the game we all take part in all day, whether we want to or not. And the minute gradations of difference and multiple opportunities for transgression, getting above your station, trying to pass yourself off as even minutely superior, or lowballing it and missing a glottal stop, all that opportunity for getting it wrong, for embarrassment, has been hugely profitable for comic writers and performers. English class is a piano keyboard of gradations on which you can play a whole sonata. Dad's Army, Faulty Towers, Steptoe, and the striving, striving class inflected overreach of Partridge and Brent. The US, of course, has its own class, race, ethnic, and regional stratifications, overall no less minutely calibrated. But class is perhaps just a stronger flavor in the UK. And if you want to cook with other ingredients, there is something liberating about being out of the constricting British class game for a while. OK. We're getting there. I'm just going to mention a couple of things to beware when writing a show set in the US and a couple of potential protections, and then we can wrap this baby up. <laughs> OK, one potential problem. Lots of people who visit New York know that weird shiver of double delight of seeing the st steam rise from the streets, just like in the films. We feel we know the US rather intimately via fiction and because our news cycle will do the collapse of a bridge in Baltimore in more detail than 10,000 dying after a dam burst in Libya. And this gloss of familiarity can be a starting point. There is even a positive version of a sort of half-knowing, if handled right. Billy Wilder's hero, Ernst Lubitsch, created a, a world in his light comedies that was both America and wasn't Lubitsch land a comic American playground where Tristan and Isolde or a Strauss waltz is always around the corner. That sort of imagined space can be enjoyable for audiences. Maybe there's, a something, maybe there's something a little like it in Laurie Nunn's Sex Education, a nun land where British comprehensives are stocked with American lockers, letter jackets, <laughs> jocks and geeks, bless you. But, but the danger, if you aren't shooting for a deliberately confected construction, is that it's easy to walk into the American environment and think you know what's going on. In Tanya Brannigan's Red Memory, she has an observation about foreigners in China, that after a month, people think they might be able to write a book about the country. After a year, an essay. After five years, maybe they could manage one true sentence. The outsider's advantage is, some, is sometimes having the confidence to say the big, clear thing. This is how it seems to me. But you must beware the sense you know America when what you know is the refracted screen version, or you can end up writing a shadow of a shadow. Research is usually the antidote to arrogance. Your outsider distance helps up to a point, but even though, like most people, I grew up suffused with US culture, did American studies to great interdisciplinary degree for history, literature, politics, all reinforcing each other, 
wanted to give a plug to American studies. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, when succession came into view, I read and read and read. On Four, in, on four Lions and later Miami Set, The Day Shall Come, I initially found Chris Morris's level of research exhausting, but eventually incredibly impressive and finally completely essential. You need to know your area inside out, especially if you're reaching it in to write, to write into another country or into another community. Knowledge is what will give you a chance of not being glib or timorous in your writing. The other very practical tip on writing a show set in America is to use your US allies. One of Billy Wilder's many pre-filmmaking jobs was teaching the Charleston as a dancer for hire. He knew all the American moves, but he nevertheless always worked with a confident American writing collaborator to make he got every detail right. On succession, we had American producers, directors, and of course a cast attuned to spot verbal and cultural slip-ups. And I lent often on the wide political and cultural knowledge of my friend and producer Frank Rich, as I know Amando did on Veep. Our writing room was always half American. They told us to our amazement that Banoffee Pie was not an American invention. <laughs> Who knew that? Uh, <laughs> and we taught them the phrase, after the Lord Mayor's show. <laughs> came up quite a lot more than I expected. It, it, you would, it would have done. Uh, and we spent many naughty hours on the difference between quite in American and British English. Of course, it's also worth saying that if you're alive to these kind of differences, verbal, class, all of them, a way to turn your outsider disadvantage to your advantage is to write key characters who are themselves outsiders. Pale, f pale fires, kinboat, botkin. Howard Belsey at the heart of, yet adrift it within, his American family in On Beauty. Half American John Self in Money. Borat, Borat and Bruno sent in by Sasha Baron Cohen and his British writers and editors to provoke. In succession, non-US born characters like Logan and Lucas Matson were able to verbalize some of our outsider barbs. Indeed, it may be that the whole class of people we wrote in succession, though they were largely American, didn't really inhabit it. Anne Milieu was rich coastal America, New York, LA, San Francisco, which stand like city republics, Florence, Siena, and Venice, jealous of one another, but disdainful of the peasants who toil in the between lands. The show is not even set in the US, really, in the same way that the mayor of East Town or even Big Little Lies is. Jerry asks Roman when he's training at an upstate theme park, is it very horrible in America? <laughs> yes, no amount of antibacterial gel is going to be able to wipe the America off me, he tells her. <laughs> Succession is set amongst the global class in a US of VC, the United States of venture capital, whose boundaries expand to wherever there might be a business with value yet to be extracted. So yes, I think you can be tough on America, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't also be respectful. After all, as Kendall says in our election episode, America is kind of a nice idea. All the different people together. <laughs> Everyone will have their red lines. For me, when we did that election episode, America poised between a nascent authoritarian and a more traditional candidate. I felt it was not within our legitimate purview. That I didn't have the sk enough skin in the game to declare a victor and predict a direction for the US, even in a fictional world. It felt too much of a judgment. One, I didn't feel it was appropriate for us to give, not when so much hangs in the balance. Okay, we're basically done. We're there. So, in summary, yes, you can, in my opinion, you can write a show in America without being an American. In terms of tone, being an outsider means there is often an itch, a wriggle, a shiver, a desire to say, you know, it can be other ways too. Also, sometimes, anger, dismay, and those can be fuel. For a while, there's nothing wrong with trying to go full American, trying to efface your outsiderness, to make a show or movie or write a book in that place as though you were a native. I tend to think, like our teachers used to tell us regarding coats, if you put it on inside, you won't feel the benefit when you go out. <laughs> That's how I feel about writing set in the US. If you don't have some form of critical, satirical standpoint, then you won't feel the benefit of the outsider perspective. I don't, and I don't think it's just my prejudice in favor of comedy or just scratchiness that makes it seem that the people who've made the best use of their outsiderness 
have made satires of one form or another, whether they're political satires like Veep or social satires like Yellow Face, White Tears, Americana and On Beauty, tech satires like Black Mirror's USS Callister or Nosedive, media satires like The Sweet Smell of Success and Ace in the Hole, or Hollywood and LA satires like Sunset Boulevard, The Loved One and Farewell My Lovely. Which is not to say your satire needs to be overt or campaigning. James Thurber wrote a friend, people never learn that there is a thousand miles of desert between a good cause and a good play. A few people can cross it alive. <laughs> Anyone who starts out to write a satire thinking the impulse to admonish or preach will make it worthwhile in itself should probably have that branded, if not on their hands, then above their keyboard. It's fuel, but fuel doesn't give you a destination any more than a tank of petrol is a map. So yes, you have a ton of disadvantages and as, as an outsider, which you can seek to ameliorate with research and study and humbleness and a trained ear and a watchful eye. But it does give you a few potential advantages. The key one being that in a show or a movie or a book, maybe the indispensable thing is that there is a tone or frequency which pulls everything taut, some argument going on that can never be settled. And America and the world is perhaps one of those tussles. America has such hopes for the world we have such hopes for it, such fears, and we're continually understanding, misunderstanding one another. Dickens was pretty sure the Americans were only about one thing, only interested in the dollar. The irony, of course, is that it was him who dropped those perhaps rather unsubtle, slightly unbalancing American scenes into Chuzzlewit, quite probably to boost the flagging sales of instalments of the novel. <laughs> who comes out of that story dollar obsessed? <laughs> American innocence and European experience is an old axis. American innocence, which it sometimes seems, has been lost regularly on the hour, every hour, since the first sailor saw the first fresh green breast of America. While all our European experience doesn't seem to teach us much of anything useful. Still, there's something in the old Henry Jamesian, Jamesian Graham Greenish opposition that we can't stop worrying away at innocence and experience, idealism and cynicism. Idealism and cynicism, it occurs to me now, is perhaps one of the submerged stories of succession. In a way, Logan's children are all American to his European. Their search for something to believe in, in amongst the pile of broken chairs, which is the sum total of his moral philosophy, is one way of looking at their tragedy. It's an old story but in some versions of the terrible, zealous hopefulness of America and the weary, used-up knowingness of Europe, somewhere in the tangle of those old ideas is still some sweet stuff, the good meat in the claw of the Atlantic lobster. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jesse, that was brilliant. Um, I'm going to open up to the audience uh, straight away. And if you're joining us online, please do send your questions in too. So we have some uh, colleagues with microphones. And the man on the end in the green jumper was very quick to raise his hand there. Worryingly quick. It's going to be a tough one. He's been <laughs> stewing on it. Uh, this is... yeah. Hello. Uh, this is going to be very simple. Um, in 2017... Um, whilst on holiday in New Zealand, I thought the appointment of Donald Trump as president was a little odd, I think. And uh, on that day, I bought um, a seven-day-per-view diary. And I thought it was going to last just a few weeks. 1,462 days later, I finished the diaries, up, right up until and including... Uh, Joe Biden's inauguration. Um, the interesting thing was after that, many people said to me, well, what are you doing with your diaries? And I said, well, they're in a cupboard because it had driven me absolutely insane writing them. And uh, can I say from the outset, Jesse, that your lecture tonight has saved me an awful lot of money in therapy, first of all. <laughs> and secondly, the book has been sold 
and is doing very well as a diary. This is the last of the signed first editions, and I'd be honoured to give it to you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Oh. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, how about um, over there in the middle? Someone else. So who's got a book? Uh, I really like I really like the lecture, and I'm a big fan of the series uh, Succession. Um, I'm a writer myself, uh, and it was very interesting when you said that even as a as a younger kid, you went to study American studies in Manchester. So it seems like it's something that was in you early on, and I was wondering why you were attracted to America in the first place. And also, uh, the first time that you went to work there as a screenwriter, um, how did you feel and uh, what was your first impression uh, back in the day? <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, why attracted to America? I think, uh, I don't know, I think, you know, just uh, probably all of us growing up in the UK, the, uh, the media, you know, uh, TV shows, uh, so American. If that was, uh, 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 trying to be honest, I can't. I don't really know. I, I know that going to university, I like the idea of being abroad, and I'm, I'm terrible at languages, so that was very appealing. <laughs> um, but I do like American people. I met, met, I met some American people young, and I, you know, um, I do enjoy being in the US, and I, without being trite and going back to the, you know, Kendall's kind of, uh, I, I can get, I can feel those emotional feelings about, you know, the best version of America being quite a uh, remarkable idea, as well as the ways it's failed, quite awful and heartbreaking. Uh, so so um, there's that. And going over there the first time, well, uh, well, one notable thing that happened with the first time we went over was me and Sam went over to translate a U US show into a UK show, and it was a huge disaster. <laughs> it was... Um, it was, it was probably still the thing that I've written that most people watched on TV at night, and yet no one will remember it. It's called Days Like These. I hope no one will remember it, <laughs> apart from a few of my friends who came to the party. Uh, best remembered for the party. And so I guess I got, I, got a, I got an early terrifying inoculation about how badly it can go when you transfer something cross-culturally and how it, things don't necessarily translate. You need to, get, you need to have a heart, beating heart in an entity, whether it's going, well, you know, all those British shows like The Office that have worked over there, they manage to take something essential uh, and make it work. Uh, and if you, if you, 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 there's no, there's no way to translate without taking that beating heart. Thank you. Uh, how about the, um, let's have a woman in, in the blue jumper over there. First of all, thank you for Succession, which I think is one of the most brilliant pieces of TV I've ever seen. Uh, and probably like everyone here was completely gripped by it. Um, I wanted to ask you about scale because I'm not a writer and I think to try and understand how you grapple with something on that scale, which feels certainly when you're about a third or halfway through, that it's just expanding and expanding and expanding and the characters are becoming more and more complex and you're dealing with not just a country of scale but a media empire of scale. Um, how do you keep a grip on it <laughs> um, and keep it focused? Yeah, it's a good question. Maybe it's a good opportunity to talk about something which I didn't talk about um, like to try and hide, but which is that Succession was written by a whole group of us, certainly not me, uh, alone. And and I guess that's the great, that's one of the great benefits of that system, the the American writing room, um, is it's a testing ground for all your ideas. And so the things which you can lose track of, go crazy about, spend months thinking about and writing all over the walls on your own. You, if you're lucky, you can you can get through in a morning with a group of smart people as you talk it out, and um, what wouldn't be obvious to a single intelligence as you as you get stuck on that little thing that you think is essential boils away quickly in the in the heat of a of a good writing room. So yeah, there's a bunch of ways 
you can do that, but I think the room is, is, is really, it's incredibly important for me for, for the way we, we did the show. Hello. Um, great writers can come from ev from anywhere, but I know you grew up in the back of beyond, in a small market town, and that you went to Croyswillen, and I went to Fitzalan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we both went to Oswestry Tech, uh -huh. where your dad taught me English. Um, so I just wonder that beyond feeling like you might be an outsider at times writing about America, whether knowing you're, have a, you have a similar background to me in Oswald Street, whether you maybe sometimes get a sense of being a, um, an imposter, and whether the authority that you write with, you sometimes maybe go back to Oswald Street and go, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a number of people from Oswald Street over there looking along to see if they recognize you. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question. I was about to get offended when you were calling Austria the back of beyond before you, you revealed that you're also from there. And <laughs> it is, it, in fact, the back of beyond uh, for England. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question. You know, you don't, the, the, out, the sort of... Everyone feels a bit outsidery in certain situations, and there's people who find life, you know, my life is made much more outsidery than it is for me. So uh, on one level, I don't want to... Uh, uh, exaggerate that sense. However, on, on an internal, personal level, that stuff is very useful fuel for you to, to write from. And although, you know, I've written lots of times about powerful people, um, the feeling of being outside that is a great perspective to come from. And frequently, you know, in, in uh, uh, the thick of it, which I was involved with, and, and in the loop, and, and succession, we often have outsider characters, you know, as well as saying that we had British uh, origin characters like uh, Logan. We also have Greg and Tom, these kind of insinuating, rather disgusting individuals <laughs> trying to sneak in, who I can see no parallels at all with, with myself, <laughs> sitting at the British Library, trying to sneak into the establishment. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, thank you. Should we have some questions from some people joining us online? Yeah, so there's a, a question here from Lucy. She says, um, it's been said that um, as, you, as real life political situations become harder and harder, um, satire is apparently more difficult to write. Do you find satire has become more difficult to write? And then I'll give you another one as well. Um, there's a question here. Uh, could, a question here from Joan. Um, good. They're, those are good. Well, Mark, good. Okay, let's, let's move it up a level in the room, yeah, because the online, we don't want the internet to beat us. <laughs> they, they, those may even be AI questions, so we, the humans need to come back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, is a satire harder? I don't know. Uh, it may be. I, I always react against that. I feel like uh, people may... The, there's a, the Tom Lehrer joke about um, they... Uh, satire became redundant when they gave Kissinger the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and the key thing about that for me is it's a joke. It's not like he gave up and was like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> he's making a joke and he's managing to get Kissinger from a different angle. So it's the same thing with Trump, I guess. It's, it's so, he's, he's so um, vivid and disgusting and outrageous that it can feel hard to find an angle on him. But the angles are there. You may just have to do, you've got to do something different. You've got to be smart. So you're, the joke that you used about Romney is not going to work about Trump. But guess what? That's, that's, that's the gig if you're going to try. And there's not, it, it's OK that it's getting harder. In fact, maybe that it'll be, uh, you, might, you might come up with more interesting material. Um, and the other question was, well, there's rather a precise question, answer to that, which is no, in that we, I tried to get a version of this. The, pre, the, pre, the, the history of succession involved me writing a, a, a screenplay about the real Murdoch family, um, which is very different to the show, which ha had a lot of research and 
fictional elements poured into it, but there is that tone thing. That's what that's what carries through, and it's a, it's a, a rather a similar tone, and um, that was very hard to get made um, uh, in the UK. Um, uh, <laughs> so. Uh, so that would be my answer to that. I, I, you know, there's a lot of ambition in British TV. British TV is brilliant, and I love it, and it's great to be back here, and I hope to work in it more. But it's, you know, there, there's issues with how much money we can spend on shows, and there, there can be issues about subjects which are difficult. You know, The BBC ha has been battered and needs to sometimes um, protect itself, and that, that means that you know, there can be self-censorship about what sorts of subjects are going to draw incoming fire, and that's, that's tough. That's not good, but um, it's the, that, that's the way it is. Thank you. What about someone at the back? Are we should see the man in the blue shirt over there. Thanks. Um, one of the things I love about the writing for Succession is it seems kind of laden with almost meaningful imperfection. Like people say things they don't quite mean or are um, uh, you know, trying to come up with a, a quip, but don't quite have the time to do it and or don't have quite have the time to think it through um, and realize it's actually quite a stupid thing to say um, and are perhaps too rushed off their feet to fully construct the argument they're trying to make in, in the debate so I was, I was wondering if you kind of agree with that sentiment and whether that's you feel that's a particularly British sen sensibility um, in your writing I think I just I just leave my bad jokes in as, and they look like they're unfinished and Tony Roach, <laughs> Tony Roach, who's sitting over there, does all the good jokes and we, we leave those ones as his. Uh, I, we, I think we do try and do that. I think you've identified something, you know, there's a tension, right? You don't want to turn on the TV and see what it's actually like around someone's dinner table. Maybe for five minutes it's fascinating, but you want to see the condensed version of that. So... We, there's artifice. It's the you know the art that conceals art. You want to make it feel real, but it's it's the condensed, exciting version of reality. And so I think we do do that. We want to have people reach the limits of their vocabulary, their em emotional and psychological vocabulary, and their verbal vocabulary. Um, so thank you. I think that's a great question. Go room. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you, internet. <laughs> we'll win. <laughs> <laughs> right, on that, so we're going to have some more from the internet. How about this one? Uh, hi, Jesse. It's a bit long now. Hi, Jesse, and he's not there. I'm really sorry I can't be there in this person. It's been my intention. Um, uh, it had been my intention. That was a terrific speech. This is Ian Scott at Manchester University. You left American Studies at Manchester the year before I joined today. I'm Professor of American Film. Uh, it would be rather amiss not to mention that you love championing the underdogs in your writing to some degree and very important for a Fulham fan as you are. Um, I wondered when it comes to writing characters that are seeking certain power or redemption, are those things different in a UK setting from an American one? In other words, is Malcolm Tucker a very different figure from Logan Roy? Thanks, Jesse. Oh, it's a good question. There's a lot of parts to it. I'm mainly thinking about Fulham and how I'm <laughs> not really a Fulham fan. I was a Manchester United fan until they went down the tubes and then I jumped ship because I could get in. Um, uh, but I'm not trying to think about that. I'm trying to think about Malcolm Tucker and Logan Roy and what the, the difference is. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, Logan exists in a... They're rather similar, right? Lo they're both um, in... The, uh, they're, they're both British, both Scottish her heritage and... So is there, is there anything meaningful that I can say about the underdogness? I guess the, the traditional view is that American championing of the underdog position, but we like that too here. I'm, try, I'm thinking on my feet if I've got a use, anything useful to say about those two characters who I like, both of whom I like writing a lot um, or have done. I'm going to I'm going to say that I don't I think this is a victory another victory for the room because I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> Can you paraphrase the kernel of the question? Do you think, Polly, or or should we move on? Because I don't have anything yeah, useful he, to I, say about it. Yeah, I think he he's interested in your interest in the underdog, and I. Yeah, I mean, I think the I'm glad he feels that way because one of the, you know, as I think about other things to to eventually write now, succession is over. 
it's seductive. Right? Like everywhere we shot, pretty much in succession, was lovely. Every most of the rooms we went to, it was like, can we hire this yacht? Oh no, that yacht isn't big enough. You know, we need a nicer yacht. And we were, uh, I mean, often we were in the hold of, of the of the yacht, in a, <laughs> getting queasy. But we, nevertheless, we were on the yacht in Croatia, and uh, you know, it, it wasn't like being on a Ken Loach set. So. <laughs> Or maybe Ken Loach shoots. Maybe he directs from a from a yacht. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's seductive. And when you think about doing something else, I consciously have to think I must not consider those considerations. <laughs> <laughs> that's not good, right? <laughs> Lifestyles of the rich and famous. So, so I guess um, it's something to beware. And we we tried to beware it in the show. The the um, the, the inherent glamorization you get when you shoot helicopters on 35 millimeter film, when you when you shoot yachts and, and glittery sea and tall buildings in financial districts, there's something quite deep in human beings that responds to that with a kind of ooh, yeah, <laughs> great, and and you you have to beware that instinct. It looks good on the edit. You you end up um, having some of those shots because they do are an important part of the feeling of the wealth I guess you try to um, woodworm your way through that all that antique furniture by showing the reality of what people's lives are like which is usually complicated and um, you know when we were, you know the family that we were portraying was quite a toxic one and, and they weren't happy people Thank you. <laughs> right, back to the room. Uh, got anyone uh, just on the end there? And then we'll uh, go to the back. Uh, so the one with the cap on the end, end of the row. Um, I was just wondering if you feel like, as a creative, as, as a writer, like, as you were saying, you've been interested in writing about America for so long. Um, if you feel like you've kind of satiated that interest, or I know, I, like you were talking about going forward and writing something else, <laughs> um, if like if you want to kind of avoid that altogether, and you feel like you've sort of fulfilled that interest, or you want to look at it from a different perspective, I was just yeah. interested in that. It's a good question. I think one of the things I would say, if the lecture was even longer, which everyone would have enjoyed, um, <laughs> would, would, would have been yeah. In a, it, 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 in a way, I guess a gesture towards this, the show it sort of it is about America and it isn't in that, you know, you'd, what is a show about America? It's, you know, like some unimaginably fat John Dos Passos novel. We're trying to fit everything in. It's impossible. So I can't, I couldn't be sated in terms of writing about America just because there's so many stories within it. And I guess the happy thing that I would encourage people to feel maybe from the lecture is that you can do it, that, the, that if, if there's a story which fascinates you and it has an American context or setting, it's possible to get there. You're going to need to research it a lot and lean on your allies, but just because it's an American subject doesn't mean that you can't go there. So I'd hope to feel liberated just as I would to do something in a, in a you know, not such um, a setting with less luster that I could do one anywhere. There was a man in the black with a blue shirt on and, and a man in a beige anorak. Did you still want to ask your questions? Yeah, okay. And then I think we'll, we'll go over there. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody born in Manchester. I did American Studies. It's been a delight listening this evening. Thank you so much. I teach American Studies now. Um, if I can be rude, could I ask two questions? One is, I wonder, as a critic, almost you act as a critical friend in the way that you write about America. And do you think, as an English writer, there's less at stake being that critical friend than there is for the American writers in the room when you're writing the work that you do. And secondly, it's often said American films and television reflect the way that Americans feel about themselves. If you think about the, the sci-fi and the communism movies of this, the 50s, the post-Watergate movies in the 70s, we've got American fiction now, Civil War, which you refer to. Where do you think the writers should be looking next? Mm. Yeah, the less at stake. I guess that's one of the dangers, because you, you don't want to be glib, or you know, the, having less at stake can, can lead you 
into not taking things as seriously. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a huge mistake that writing America from the outside could lead you into not taking it as seriously uh, as you would. And, 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 you know, I touched on that about us not wanting to, to sort of, even in a fictional format, uh, say what, how the election turned out. So I think you should take it really seriously. I think you should try and feel it as weightingly as an American writer would. Um, poor, where next? Oh, I don't know. I'm enjoying the curse. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we were going over to the, the man in the beige anorak there and then the man in the pale blue shirt over there, grey. I can't see under the lights. Hi. Um, we spent a lot of time in Manchester in this room, going there again. Um, uh, when at Manchester I was preparing students to go on their exchange year, I used to warn them about the fact that they would... I, never, I tried not to use the word outsiders, but that they might find some difficulty in bringing into focus the culture that they were moving into, and, but that this was going to be exciting, <laughs> creative, and even though they'd feel miserable after two months, later on they'd feel much better. Um, but I also warned them that when they came back, they'd have the same feeling about coming back to the UK. They'd be so um, climatised uh, that they'd uh, change. And I wonder whether the moving across, not just then, uh, when you, you went to Massachusetts, I think. Yeah, um, not just then, uh, but since then, the, the 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 work in the two cultures, and 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 the need to refocus each time you look at them. Whether that has stayed with you and been part of your creative process. Yeah, I think uh, that's definitely that that bit of sh culture shock. Everyone, even who goes for a summer holiday knows the feeling of coming back to Gatwick and Heathrow and sort of seeing <laughs> Britain afresh for good and bad and being like, oh, wow, this is where I, this is really where I live, this strange country <laughs> uh, with the beef eater opening her arms say, in a way that I don't think has ever happened. Welcome to Heathrow. Um, so, yeah, and I think that's, that's uh, a flavour that I would hope uh, you might think about from the lecture is about that that um, that slight alienation that freshness of view that can be really useful in I think it's really creatively useful for everyone being and if you can find a, um, a way like um, looking at another country and then but then not mistaking that that strong first impression for truth then then you're into some some good areas aren't you yeah Thanks, Jesse. Shall we somebody just, right on the yeah, back on the left. Right on the back on the left, yeah. Shall we go, we, and then the, the bloke down there. Uh, brilliant, thank you. There. Hello. Hi. Um, Hi. I wanted to talk about Succession's unique ability to humanise characters that are villainised in everyday society. And there are certain scenes that, for me, a huge fan, <laughs> um, stuck with me. The, um, the scars on Logan's back are like permeated in my brain. Um, the, the death um, of, the, of the guy in Scotland in the... Oh. So, because it's, we are meant to hate them. But at the same time, it's very psychoanalytic, very Jungian to see them as the whole self. So I wanted to know whether you thought about it psychoanalytically to, for us to see them as humans before their wealth. Great words. It's, you say kind words about the show, and I'm glad you feel that way. It's, yeah, it's complicated, right? You, we, the show, I think, without being explicit, is hopefully, hopefully shot through with a moral perspective about these people. And yet, you know, that Thurber quote about the thousand miles of desert between the, you know, um, good cause and the good play, you, you need to put all that aside. And then, then the irony is if you put it all aside so much, you can create 
you know, Roman is a pretty much overt racist, and and the problem isn't that people said, oh, you can't put him on TV. It's that most people are like trying to sell T-shirts <laughs> of him. So there's a curious thing that goes on when you give people a full human version of what you know the headline would be. Yeah, as you say, they're bad, bad people doing bad things to the world. Um, and I guess the the root out of it is finding someone like yourself, is finding viewers who find the, sh the show bracing and interesting because it does try to do both those things at once, have a moral attitude to the world and to the things happening in the world, but accepts that we're all quite faulted and would we be any different were we born in those shoes, I guess is the, is the question you might ask yourself watching it. But thank you for your... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a psychoanalytical, I guess all writers hopefully should be thinking a bit in those terms. That there, there isn't any formal um, psychoanalysis going on, but we're, it's a room full of people with lots of different experiences, and there's, there's some um, talk in those terms occasionally. Okay, thank you. We're going to the man over there um, with the grey shirt on. And um, then I think that might be, might be, we'll just have time for one more after that. A lot of pressure to make this worth it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. We've killed oh, off the internet, though. Right. <laughs> um, I'm a TV writer and I also did American studies, so you and I are the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> my question is very uh, simple. I knew that I, my draw to America growing up in a very uh, poor part of London was the scale and the kind of unapologetic consumerism. And I wonder if that is all, at all similar for you, and if after writing something as glamorous as Succession, have you been corrupted from that in any way? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, Tony Roach, who's here, will remember that there was a point uh, where we went with the last, the last scenes of the final episode were shot in uh, Barbados, and because of um, reasons about the cast, we had to take a Warner Brothers private jet to get there. And um, I'm so sorry. By this time, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a nice thing, Jeremy Strong brought some caviar on the plane. And <laughs> as we were eating the caviar on the private jet, I did wonder whether the time for our satirical takes <laughs> on, on the super wealthy were maybe coming to an end. Uh, so, yeah, you have to be careful with that stuff. I was terrified because I thought small plane, more chance of going down. But, um, uh, and the first part of your question was the, the consumerism. Well, I don't know. It's a push and a pull, isn't it? When you go there, it's, it's one of the things we sort of laugh at. You know, the pharmaceutical ads, this, you know, will cause suicidal thoughts and anal bleeding. And yet here's somebody getting out of their minivan and going to take their kids to soccer in the morning. It's... It's, it's very, uh, but you're there for a little while and you're like, yeah, maybe I'll, I'd like, well, I don't want my psoriasis. I'll take the, <laughs> never, mind, never mind the suicidal thoughts. I think I can cope. I'll take my, my shirt off. Um, so uh, <laughs> it's very appealing. Yeah, I, I, I think the whole package, it's, it can, it, you know, there's to the British sensibility when you first go, it can feel gross, overly vivid. But, you know, when, when, when you're there for a while, it's, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot to enjoy. Is that a suitably upbeat ending? <laughs> <laughs> I think that is. I think that's a very good place to end. Can I just thank you again, Jesse, for such a, a brilliant lecture? I'm sure I'm not the only one who would have loved it if you'd gone on and oh, on with, you. your, with your lecture. But thank you so much and for your, um, your, your responses to, to people's questions. Thank you to the audience here in the room and thank you to everyone online for making it such a, a, a really interesting and funny evening. Thank you. Thank you.